Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm very grateful to be with you all here uh, on the Sabbath. Um, very thankful for another opportunity to share the word of God. Uh, also considering the prayer request and uh, happy to hear the voice of our dear brother and pastor Taylor. Um, I do pray that we uh, take these things very serious. Um, I remember uh, early in my Christian experience, believing that the success of the church was upon others. You know, I believe that, you know, if the pastor was praying, then things will be good. If that prayer warrior brother or that prayer warrior sister was pr praying, then things will be good. And I never uh, in my early experience, never realized how God wanted me to be one who was praying, how uh, the success of the church and the health of others and just the general well-being of others, um, uh, that they were depending, their, their experience was also dependent upon my prayers. And I just want to encourage everyone, uh, take prayer serious personally, individually, and uh, pray as if it all depends upon you. Um, it would be better to have that thought than to have the thought of maybe some, maybe this person isn't praying or maybe that person wasn't faithful, which is, you know, unfortunately our human tendency to, to look and to criticize as opposed to criticizing ourselves first and then being faithful. You know, uh, that's one of the uh, unfortunate realities is that, uh, you know, we're not faithful while criticizing. We're not faithful while you know, looking at this or concerned about that. So may we be faithful and may we realize that God is giving us an opportunity and praying for others. You know, it's not, it shouldn't be a burden, a heavy burden, but a light burden, uh, a burden that we share with Christ. So be encouraged um, and let's believe that God will hear and answer because that has been his uh, promise. We are going to, uh, let me just make sure my recorder is also ready. We're going to, um, have a word of prayer and get back into our study uh, on the needs of the body. Uh, this one will be somewhat of a review because we're about to end this series on the needs of the body in, a, in the next couple of Sabbaths. Uh, so this one will be sort of a review <clears throat> before we finish off the last, I believe, two health laws that we will consider in our study of the needs of the body. So with that, we're going to have a word of prayer. Again, asking for God's Holy Spirit and asking that our hearts are, you know, settling in our minds to be open to hear the word of God, asking God to make us willing to be made willing. So uh, let's have a word of prayer and then get into our study for this morning. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we recognize ourselves to be weak and erring mortals. But we also recognize that you are the savior of mankind. You are the God, the true God, uh, the one who understands us the most, uh, the one who gave and made a sacrifice in our behalf. Uh, so Lord, we are, are confident that it is your desire and plan to save us. But we need your help, Lord. Uh, we're so faulty. Uh, there's so much going on within and without. And today we just want to humble ourselves to acknowledge our great need of your help in every way, physically, mentally, spiritually. Uh, it's very easy for us to take note and witness the physical sicknesses. But Lord, how many are suffering from spiritual sicknesses, spiritual cancers, and, and, and even though they are attending church, planning and on their way out of the church. Lord, please help us with our mental issues. And Lord, as it was mentioned, the physical issues. Uh, we, we, we need your help and we need wisdom on how to address all of these things speedily so that all can witness and behold Christ in every service done for them and as services done for one another. We want to have Christ with them. So, Lord, please hear our cry. Uh, we, we ask even especially today for your Holy Spirit, for your presence. Um, I recognize that it will not do me any well for just my thoughts to be shared. So I, I want to present myself as an empty vessel, 
uh, that uh, the education I've received would be from above, uh, that it would be just the words that you need, that we need to hear from you. So please, Lord, send your spirit to be our speaker. Uh, send him to be our comforter. Send him to show us our need. Uh, Lord, although these things may be sometimes even hard to hear, uh, sometimes we, we look into the mirror and we don't want to see the picture. We would rather see others. But Lord, may you show us that you are a kind and merciful God, uh, that you uh, chasten us while there is still hope. And Lord, then we're asking that you would save us in the end. And not only us, but those under our influence. Again, we mentioned before you the request uh, spoken as well as unspoken, and we do not believe that you are wearied by our prayers, by our request. So we press them to your throne. We plead with you. We produce our strong cause, look at our need, and answer as you have always done. And our desire and hope is that we would receive it fully, uh, all that you grant us to save us. Again, Lord, we look to your spirit and we pray these things with the thought of Christ's merits, his goodness. And this gives us confidence to know that you will hear and answer according to your will. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As I mentioned to you, we will be soon finishing up our series on the needs of the body. So I wanted to, uh, I think this week and next week, do a short review because it has been so spread out. We, uh, my family and I were away for so long um, and the opportunity to preach on these subjects uh, have been away from me in the last recent months. Although we are together on Sundays, I have not been able to uh, consistently address this, the, the various topics in this series. So um, I want to go back to a verse in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter three. Uh, today, we're going to revisit um, the health law of nutrition in the body. Uh, we have talked about this in the past when we talked about a nutrition and exercise, and we touched both of them very briefly. Uh, and the focus for uh, our study in that past study on nutrition was uh, the need to eat. And we will continue with that thought, but from the perspective of actually being fed. In other words, the body of Christ, God's people, um, he has a certain way that he actually feeds them. And uh, we can find that in the book of Jeremiah. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter three. Jeremiah chapter three is where we're going to begin our study today. And we're talking about the needs of the body, the body being the body of Christ, God's church. And we're speaking uh, of God's church locally, even though these things do apply generally to God's church. Uh, we're speaking locally for our church. Um, this idea of nutrition to the body, the need to feed the body and how God has actually determined to do that. And the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter three, we're going to start in verse 12. Jeremiah chapter three and verse 12, the word of God says, go and proclaim these words towards toward the north and say, return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Verse 13 says, only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and has scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. And this is, uh, these, verse, these first two texts do uh, address a reality that we cannot get away from. Um, we don't like to acknowledge that we are away from God when sin is in our life, or if we do something that we know we shouldn't do, we don't like the idea that there is a separation between us and God. We would like to believe that everything is, you know, okay, and that all I have to do is just confess and everything is, you know, uh, peachy or fine. Uh, but we, 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 we have to stop to consider what has actually happened and that there is a separation and that in that decision that was made to disobey God in whatever way it has happened, or even if it's been neglect of some instruction or 
uh, or, 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 you know, principle that God has laid before us, um, as the Bible acknowledges, to him that knoweth to do right and doeth and not, to him it is sin. So when that happens, uh, there's a break in the relationship. And the Bible illustrates it as uh, us leaving God. Uh, although we may like to think we're still close, the Bible says we have left God. And it identifies that in this verse by saying return to God. And the beauty of it is that God identifies that he's a merciful God. Um, and that lets me know that it is okay to hear my wrong. You know, it's okay to be rebuked. It's okay to be corrected. Some of the things that we dread, you know, uh, I, I've learned in life that uh, usually when our sin is identified, the first thing that pops in our mind is the sin of the one who is speaking to us. You know, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, you're doing this, uh, you said this wrong thing to me. And oftentimes the first thought for us is, well, you say wrong things all the time. And, you know, we don't really stop to address and we don't feel comfortable just saying you're right. I am wrong. I've done something terrible and I should never do it again. It's almost as if we have to make sure that we are not the only guilty party. And the thing is, when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to coming to Christ, uh, we are the only guilty party. You know, we can't look to the other people around us and say, but Lord, what about them? God brings our sin to our mind and he says, return to me. And to make it a bit easier, you know, from my understanding, God says, I'm merciful. You know, you don't have to put up a wall. You don't have to, uh, you know, uh, feel exposed per se, because God is saying, I'm not telling you this to condemn you. I'm not telling you this to shut you down. I'm not telling you this to make you look bad per se. I'm telling you this because I am merciful. This is the, the example that is put forth, or this is the character of God that is revealed to you and I as guilty sinners. And surely we're all guilty, but the Bible says, God says that he is merciful. He's actually giving us an invitation to return to him and he says, just acknowledge your sin. Just acknowledge that. Of course, guilt, the feelings of guilt are there, but it's okay. God is willing to forgive us. And then the Bible goes on to say, again, in verse 14, uh, turn, O backsliding children. And this lets us know that God is pressing home the point. Uh, don't, come, don't, don't try to convince yourself that, okay, you know, everything is okay. Make sure you have turned. Make sure you have given up that sin. Make sure you have truly made things right with God because the tendency of, 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 of humans in our experience is the same things are repeated. The same sins are repeated. So God wants this point to be driven home to the heart. And that means that we need to accept it. He's saying, turn, O backsliding children, said the Lord, and then he says, for I'm married to you, unto you. So at the beginning, he says, I'm merciful. But then he says, I am married. So God is giving us assurances that it is not his desire to be away from us. Despite our terrible condition, despite our sinfulness, he says, I am joined to you. I'm still living to please you. And because of this, you must recognize, I must recognize the relationship that God is calling me into, a, a, a relationship of marriage. That implies that this is something that God wants forever. That implies that God is not only willing to, live, to, to please us, but also desiring for us to live pleasing in his sight. The word of God goes on to say, for I am married unto you and I will take you one of a city and two of a family and will I will bring you unto Zion and, and Jeremiah, all through the, the book of Jeremiah, you'll often see Jeremiah or God uh, expressing through Jeremiah that the condition that his people are in of being scattered, that God doesn't want it always to be like that. And he expresses that or he expresses his desire to gather them in many ways. In this verse, God is just saying, you're scattered, you're spread out. I want to gather you, even though you're spread out and you're scattered as a result of your disobedience even though it seems like you are cast away from me, I'm committed to my relationship with you. My desire is to save you. My desire is to gather you. And then he says in verse 15, 
and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. As we talk about the needs of the body, nutrition, uh, in a physical sense, we are dealing with that which we consume, you know, uh, eating the right things, avoiding the, the things that are injurious to our bodies, and then having self-control or eating moderately those things that are good for us. Uh, but we are applying this to the body of Christ, the church of God. And what we see is, as far as nutrition is concerned, God gives his church pastors to actually feed them. Now, just as it is in the natural, so in the spiritual, and vice versa. Um, just as there are pastors who will feed the people of God with knowledge and understanding, um, as you know, I believe, uh, you understand that there are also pastors that will not give the people true knowledge and true understanding. Uh, there are some pastors who uh, soothe the itching ears of the members. Uh, there are some pastors who teach erroneous views, who have a, a personal agenda to have a following for themselves. So there are a number of ministers or types of ministers in the world uh, but God's desire and God's plan is to specifically give his church pastors to feed them. So nutrition generally to the body comes from ministers, those who have the word of truth in their mouth, those who have the a word of knowledge in their mouth. Those are the ones that God has uh, given his spirit to and, 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 and call to actually feed the body. Now, what's interesting about this is that all of us in some way are ministers, are preachers, are teachers. So we all personally have a responsibility to teach the word of God. Christ gave that commission to the disciples when he says, go ye therefore. That was him saying, all of you have a responsibility. And it's important to know that generally, all of us have a responsibility to feed the church in some way. Now, let's look at this in some other verses. Um, before we do that, though, I want to go to another verse here in the book of Deuteronomy. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy here and Deuteronomy 15. No, Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. Actually, pardon me. Before we go to Deuteronomy 17, Let's go to Jeremiah 23, since we're already here. Jeremiah 23. Uh, there is a, another way that God feeds his people. I believe we've looked at this before, but I just want to revisit this. Uh, Jeremiah uh, 23, before we go to Deuteronomy. And I want to look here in verse, uh, I believe it's verse... Two, yes, this is the verse that I want. Jeremiah 23 and verse two. I'll read verses one and two. This is a woe to false shepherds, false pastors, or pastors that give the wrong type of message. Um, it says, woe unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people, Ye have scattered my flock. Obviously, this is referring to pastors that do not feed the people with knowledge and understanding. It says, and have driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. Here, God says that these pastors did not visit them. And this is a reference to the work of what a pastor has to do in preaching knowledge and understanding. There are times where he must visit them, as it were. but that just means that he is visiting them with the judgments of God. Um, as the Bible says in another place, lift up that, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their sins. When God is here telling the people uh, that uh, are telling these pastors that they did not visit the people of God, it's in reference to the messages where they are warning them against their sins. Instead, these ministers are giving smooth messages. They're not letting the people know about their sin or their condition before God. Uh, but nevertheless, we can apply this in a practical sense that God says, my pastors must visit my people. 
They must know the people. They must be close to the people. They must have a true, honest regard and love for the people. They must recognize themselves as servants to the people. So even in a physical sense, there is a high calling upon ministers to draw close to the people and actually visit them. But in verse 12 of Deuteronomy 17, just following the verse here in Jeremiah chapter 23, Deuteronomy 17, the Bible says it like this, Deuteronomy 17, and I want to jump down to verse 12, Deuteronomy 17 and verse 12, the Bible says here, dealing with ministers, uh, God feeding his people, it says, and the man that will do presumptuously. And will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister therefore before the Lord thy God or unto the judge, even that man shall die and thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. Why did I read this verse? Because what we find is, brothers and sisters, that there is a responsibility on both sides. That when you look at God's people as a whole, everyone has to say, I must come up higher. I must do better. Because God's church has to be fed. Not only does God's church have to be fed, the people have to eat. So what we see is a, a trade in a sense. Everyone has to do their part and everyone will receive of that. And God is saying as individuals, from pastors to members, are you doing your part? Are you being faithful to feed? Are you being faithful to receive? Uh, the Bible says also in Mount Mar uh, Micah, let's go to Micah chapter seven. I'm just trying to put these texts together that deal with this idea of feeding, deals with this idea of eating, all to do with the nutrition of the body, how the body stays healthy from eating. And I'm going to the book of Micah, Micah seven. And I'm going to be reading here in verse 14. Pardon me. Micah 7 and verse 14. And I'm reading in your hearing. The Bible says here, notice, Micah 7 and verse 14, it says, feed thy people with thy rod. The flock of thine inheritance, which dwell solitarily in the wood in the midst of Carmel, let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. As I said, putting all this together, if you remember what was mentioned in Jeremiah 23, where he's talking about uh, his pastors that scattered instead of feeding his people, instead of visiting them, they were called to visit uh, uh, God's people with judgments because they were, in, they were disobeying God. Micah illustrates that by saying, feed my people with a rod. This rod all through the Bible is identified as a rod of correction. So God gives the ministers a very solemn responsibility to bring before the people their sin. So not only a knowledge and understanding generally of the way of salvation, but also a way of correction. And this is something that's very serious. You know, I always think about this for myself and I this is how I would know for myself if I was not faithful in having devotion individually. And I encourage you to do this for yourself. And I would gauge it by what I would be hearing on the Sabbath. And I would always say to myself, I should not be hearing worse than I've heard throughout the week. In other words, I should not be extremely condemned on Sabbath, but throughout the week, I am not condemned, meaning I have not met God face to face. And this is not saying that, you know, the person should be in sin, but the closer we grow to, the closer we grow to Christ, the more we will see ourselves. I should not be only on the Sabbath saying that I'm a sinner. For me and my experience, that would usually mean that I haven't been spending time with God throughout the week. So I consider brothers and sisters, because the minister's responsibility truly is to feed the people of God to bring before them the truth, to bring before them the way of salvation, but also they are responsible for bringing before the people their sins, what is required of them. But again, this does not just apply 
to the pastor in the desk. Uh, we have a tendency to believe that the great burden is wholly upon the, the pastors. And we forget that as individuals, we all are called to ministry. We're all called to preach. This is illustrated in two ways here. Go with me in your Bibles to 1 John now. Dealing, as I said, with nutrition in the body. 1 John chapter 3 is where I want to go. And we're just going to spend a few moments in the Bible. Then I want to read some quotes that illustrate this also. 1 John chapter 3. And the Bible says here in 1 John chapter 3, I want to go to verse 16, just to put into view the responsibility upon all of us. The Bible says here in 1 John chapter 3 and verse uh, 16, the Bible says, Hereby uh, perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, notice, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. A general statement that applies to all, where the Bible shows that everyone is called to lay down their life. And this is uh, a, a statement that is referring to ministry. It's a statement that's referring to us giving ourselves to ministry. And although uh, you know the great majority will not find themselves as full-time ministers, meaning those who are supported by the tithe, nevertheless, guess what? You're still full-time ministers. You still have a ministry full-time. You still are always called to be witnesses for Christ. You're always called to have your life laid down for the purpose of service to others. And the Bible goes on to say, finishing up in verse 17, it says, but whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have a need. So notice, we may say, well, a minister, a pastor has been called, uh, and upon uh, answering his call, he becomes a full-time minister. But the Bible defines it a little bit differently. Uh, the Bible says, did you see anyone with a need? You see, uh, one, one thing I've learned, especially in the church, is that it's very easy to identify needs. But in identifying needs, it's also easy to believe that work is to someone else. But if you notice here in the scripture, the Bible says, if you see a need, if you are able to recognize that, someone else may not be able to recognize it, or they may be addressing other needs. You never know, but do you see a need? Do you see where something should be better? Do you see where something should be taken care of? Uh, as I've said, in many sermons, and I've uh, these things always stay in my mind because when I was younger and I would be in the church, I heard these things. I never knew that later in life I would have to say, you know what, I need to avoid that. You know, isn't it terrible to see an example in the church that you shouldn't follow? You know, it it, it would be good to only see good examples in the church. But in my childhood, going into the church. I never knew that later in my life experience that God would refer back to those moments and say, don't do that. And I remember being a young kid talking to so-and-so and talking to this person and hearing the statements where people say, you know, I'm just here to get the word. I, I'm not here to get involved with all that's going on uh, or, or looking and saying, you know, they, they don't know how to manage things. So I don't even want to get involved or, you know what, I'm going to leave that to them. I do my own work. God has a personal calling upon me. I, I'm just going to do what God puts on my heart, but not wanting, wanting to be involved in the church and involved in the ministry of the church. Almost saying what Paul warns us against. I don't need them. They don't need me. I'm okay. The Bible says, finishing up here, notice, but whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? So we're applying this to the church right now. Uh, you, you may say, well, you know, that's the wrong application. Well, let's make sure. The Bible says, if you have this world's good and you see a brother have a need, the Bible doesn't determine where you see them. The Bible just says, do you see the need? If you see a need, then why would you withhold your talents? Why would, you, why would you withhold your goods? Why would you withhold what you have that can actually help the situation? 
Now let's make sure that this applies to us as a body, or if it can be applied to a body. Go with me in your Bible to the book of James. Let's go over to the book of James. And a text that we usually apply just to faith is actually something that is applied directly to seeing the need of one's body. Let's consider that here. The Bible says here in uh, James chapter 2, James chapter 2, notice here in verse 14, James chapter 2 and verse 14, the Bible reads, it says, what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man may say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? So this is a challenge to test ourselves individually to see whether or not my faith is a living faith or if it's just a profession. And this has nothing to do with my judgment upon someone else. I can't determine for someone else's their faith, but I can determine for myself. And the Bible says this is how you determine for yourself where your faith stands. It says in verse 15, it says, if a brother or sister be knit, <clears throat> pardon me, naked and destitute of daily food. Now consider, this is a verse that's actually talking about the body in a physical sense. So it definitely applies to the body in a physical sense. Generally in our Christian experience, if we see someone with a need, what does the Bible require us to do? Find how we can help. That's the first thing we, we, we must decide upon. If we personally see a need in someone else's life, how can I help? Once I've exhausted myself, then I bring others on. Then I bring it to other people's attention. But as far as I'm able to help, I have a responsibility. So we need to consider that here. And then the Bible says, in verse 16, it says, oh, pardon me. It says in verse 16, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notice, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are what? Needful to the body, what doth it profit? So think now, can we apply this spiritually? Can we apply this to the church as the body of Christ? What would this instruction teach you and I? Do you see needs in the church? Do you see places for improvement? Do you see things that need to be adjusted or supported? Have you seen that? Then what was your conclusion? Was your conclusion such that it revealed no faith, no true faith, no true regard for the body, no true regard for your brother? Consider, brothers and sisters, because the Bible says, as far as the body is concerned, if you see a need for the body, you should come up to help. You should do your part. And we sometimes forget this, I believe, brothers and sisters. I remember when I used to be a Bible worker, how much my example as a Bible worker encouraged other people to go into the field. And I remember after church, if the Bible workers were just hanging around and not really trying to go into the field, then the church members often would just hang around. But if the Bible workers were right after church, looking at the time saying, I have context, I have context to see, I have work to do, the other church members will be encouraged. And, he, and oftentimes we will say, hey, can you come with me? And people will say, of course we will go. Of course we will go. So I, I say that because it just reminds me of the fact that we have to do more, all of us, from pastors to members. It's not just the pastors. It's not just the members. All of God's people, wherever we see needs, we need to come up to the plate and do a faithful work. This is laying down our life for the brethren. Is our life that much more important than the work of God? You know, let's not forget that the work of God is what we are to actually seek first. And let's not forget that in being corrected on these things, it is not a judgment. It is not to bring anyone down. It's not to discourage anyone because when God brings to us our condition, he says, I'm mercy. I'm merciful. He says, I'm married to you. I'm committed to this relationship. This should encourage in us a desire to return. This should encourage us a desire to now redeem the time, to now be faithful, 
to take up the work that was neglected, to really search our heart and go back to God and say, Lord, before I look at where everyone else has failed, where have I failed? Before I look at how everyone else has not done what they needed to do, have not fed the body properly, where have I withheld my hand? Where have I not laid down my life for the body? Here's being illustrated, and I'll read it just one more time. In verse 16 and 17, it says, And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warm and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. When there's a problem, I need to be a part of the answer. I need to say, you know what? There's a need there. I can't just send the problem away saying it'll be fixed or somebody else will take care of it. I need to give something. Something needs to come from me in order to address that. And then the Bible finishes by saying, what does it profit? What is the benefit of only identifying a need? What is the profit to that? What, what good does it actually do? And it is tied to our faith. The last part says, even so, if faith hath not works, is dead being alone. So there needs to be faith, true faith. True faith will rep is represented by me being a part of the solution, by me taking up my neglected work, by me doing the part that I have neglected to do, as well as adding to where others are neglecting. You know, one thing I've learned in life, we don't like to do what we think others are responsible for. We don't like to do what we think other people need to do. And I remember when I was getting married, I, the Lord really blessed me with people who had some spiritual insight. And I remember one of the things someone said is one person says, man, it must be 50 50. Your wife has to do her part. You have to do your part. If y'all don't do, if each other doesn't do their part, then it's not going to work. And I said, okay, I got to just be faithful to my part and my marriage will be perfect. And then you learn that if the other spouse doesn't do their part, then you're in trouble. And I'm not saying that about my wife, just to be clear. But what I'm saying is later I received some advice just before I was married and it changed my view. And they said, some days you may do 90%. And your wife does 10% or she's going to do 80% and you're going to do 20%. In other words, wherever there is a need or a lack, you do it. You fulfill it. You be faithful. And I learned, I said, well, I need to settle that thought before I get married. Because in life, I was taught as long as I do my part, if no one else does their part, that's their problem. But you learn in relationships generally. It's not fun. It's not how it works. But in the church now, consider. In the body, consider. Everything compensates each other. Everything works together. If this is working and it, or it's not working, then the other parts of the body, as the Bible says, suffer. In other words, they feel the burden of it. So that lets you and I know. If I see something wrong, I should come up to the plate. I should at least try to help others see that they have a responsibility. And this is something that we also don't consider. Help others, encourage someone, help them. We just would rather condemn. We would rather just let it fall. And then when it falls, we would rather sit back and say, you see, I, I told you, but not showing any faith and not showing any true regard or true love. I want to read a couple of quotes and then I want to close with a couple of texts. As I said, it would not be too much time. This is somewhat of a review. I'm going to share my screen. If the host would unlock. Is that possible? If I'm not able to share my screen, then I'll just have to give you the references. Thank you so much. I just want to show a couple of quotes before we close. As I said, this would be a review just before we close off this series. I wanna make sure that we are getting as much as we can because you know, indirectly we'll probably revisit a lot of these issues, 
but directly. Uh, we want to at least have a thorough understanding of where we should be and how we should be doing things so that we can move forward in a way that is pleasing to God. This is a couple of quotes that deal with the responsibilities of a church from the pastors down to the membership. And this has to do with the issue of feeding the body. Everyone has a responsibility in feeding the body and being ministers one to another. Uh, quotes that I usually bring up, I usually put them in a question answer format, like a Bible reading, just for the sake of those who are following along. It says here, notice, where should more time be spent? As far as the church is concerned, as far as the ministers especially, notice. It says there is a need of coming close to the people by personal effort. I know in my ministry personally, this is a place where, or this is a portion of my ministry where I have uh, failed tremendously and lacked in many ways uh, for various reasons, but it does not uh, change the fact that it is required of God. And I simply have to humble myself and say, Lord, I will do what you've asked me to do and love to do it and, and believe that God will, will be there with me because he says, it's the privilege of the watchman on the walls of Zion to live so near to God and to be so, so, so susceptible to the impressions of his spirit. So I, there's blessings in doing what God requires me to do. There's blessings in doing what God requires you to do. But she continues, there's a need of coming close to the people by personal effort. She says, if less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministries, greater, greater results would be seen. I love this quote. Um, it shows that we have an opportunity to draw closer to the people of God. And, you know, I think of it as a, in a sense of, I would love to grow closer, to have closer family members. I, I would love to be able to have a better relationship, a more spiritual relationship with the members to where you can go in, your, in their homes and tell them, hey, this is something that has to be corrected and hear the same information and actually work together to correct both so that the church can be in a better place. But at the place that we are in the sense now, many people don't wanna hear about sins. You think about when you go to someone's home, what are you gonna talk about? What are you gonna talk about? Is it just a Bible study? Because for many of the believers, they have studied a lot of the things and they're hearing these things constantly. So what are the things that you will talk about as you draw closer to the members? Think about it. There are to be greater results seen, seen where? Think about this now. So you can be clear on what is gonna happen when ministers draw close, when they're doing more personal ministries, what are gonna be the greater results that are to be seen? Are they gonna preach more powerfully? Is the Bible going to be opened up a better or are people gonna have greater understanding or is it a reference to results in the lives of the members? And think about this now, what will those results be? It goes on to say, those who occupy the position of under shepherds are to exercise a watchful diligence over the Lord's flock. This is not to be a dictatorial vigilance, but one that tends to encourage and strengthen and uplift. So this is what is to be expected from the ministers, and this is what is to be the effect upon the lives of the membership. It says ministry means more than sermonizing. It means earnest personal labor. The pastors, we have to get to work. We have to get in the homes. We have to make sure the people are fed, but that they are also eating, that they're receiving what they're hearing. I'm going to jump down. You can read this. Uh, personally in your own time, just some additional information of how the uh, work of the gospel is to work in the life and to actually help the people. I'm going to jump down to the boat here. It says pastors are needed, faithful shepherds who will not flatter God's people. You remember we talked about uh, God feeds them through the rod. Are members ready for ministers to come to their homes and say, you need to be more faithful in your church attendance? You need to be more faithful with your children. Your children are out of line in the church or you need to be this or this needs to happen. Or as I behold your experience as a, as a member in the church, I want to encourage you to do this more or to be faithful here. Are members actually ready to receive that? 
from pastors visiting, drawing close to personal, to be uh, in personal labor. It says, who will not flatter God's people nor treat them harshly, but notice who will feed them with the bread of life. Men who in their lives feel daily the converting power of the Holy Spirit and who cherish a strong, unselfish love towards those for whom they are labor, for whom they labor. It says there, there is tactful work for the under shepherd to do as he is called to meet alienation, bitterness, envy, and jealousy in the church. What should we expect as pastors to receive, to feel as a result of doing a faithful work? Alienation, bitterness, envy, jealousy. As I said, when someone brings to you your sins, when somebody may bring to me my sins, what is the first thought? What about your unfaithfulness? That's how we think. You're telling me what I should do, but what about you doing what you should do? It says, and he will need to labor in the spirit of Christ to set things in order. Faithful warnings are to be given, sins rebuked, wrongs made right, not only by the minister's work in the pulpit, but by personal labor as pastors. Where we have failed, we must come up to the, to the plate. We must, be, we must do a faithful work or we cannot be faithful ministers. That's just the bottom line. We have to do a personal labor for the people of God. And they have to be willing to receive it. It says, the wayward heart may take exception to the message. And the servant of God may be misjudged and criticized. Has that ever happened? Ask the pastors. Someone came to me one day and they said, why were you talking about me? And they were not saying that in a joking manner. They said, I don't appreciate you talking about me. I don't appreciate you trying to expose me. And I had no idea what they were talking about. And as I'm talking to them, I started to get uncomfortable because they were getting very like angry and irate and like they wanted to do something to me. And I'm like, whoa, calm down. I, I'm not, a, and, but they knew that I, I guess, knew something about them. And they said, you're trying to uh, embarrass me or something like that. And I, I literally, I really didn't know. And I was surprised. And that's why I was uncomfortable because I did not expect the anger and, and all that. But again, this is just something ministers will have to deal with. Because people are going to say, you're talking about me. You were at my house last week. So now this week, when you're talking about this topic and that topic, why are you pointing me out? Well, it says... For the minister, let him then remember that the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruits of righteousness is sown in them, pardon me, and sown is sown in peace of them that make peace. Uh, let me read just a few more. It says, the work of the gospel minister is to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hidden God. If one, this is a serious quote, entering upon this work chooses the least self-sacrificing part, contenting himself with preaching only and leaving the work of personal ministry for someone else, his labors will not be acceptable to God. Have mercy on me. It says souls for whom Christ died are perishing for want of well-directed personal labor, and he has mistaken his calling, who, entering upon the ministry, is unwilling to do the personal work that the care of the flock demands. Very solemn. It leads me to say, Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing. Let it be, Lord, so be it. I mean, it's not a terrible thing. It's a, a necessary thing. It's an amazing thing to, to consider the benefit of being able to work for others and have the presence of the angels and the impressions of God's spirit. It says the truth, the spirit of the true shepherd is one of self-forgetfulness. He loses sight of self in order that he may work the works of God by the preaching of the word and by the personal and by personal ministry in the homes of the people. He learns their needs. Notice now, because she's explaining what is going to actually take place when you, when members are being visited, and the benefits to the pastor of allowing God's presence to closely dwell with him. It says, by the preaching of the word and by personal ministry of the homes, 
He learns their needs. So you need to know, members, when you get visited, the pastors are learning your needs. Let your needs be known. You know, don't have that type of home that when the pastor's coming over, we got to make everything nice. Hide the cheese. Hide the movies. Hide this. Let them, they can't see my life because I don't want them to know what is why. What, what is the per? Do you want to remain in hypocrisy? Do you want to remain in a lukewarm state or do you actually want the personal labor? Because it's in a way allowing Christ into the home. They must come with the spirit of Christ, but Christ is sending someone to feed you. Not just with knowledge and understanding, but even with the raw. Are you willing to hear that? Are you, are you willing to allow a pastor to be a pastor? It says he learns their needs, their sorrows, their trials, and cooperating, powerful. With the great burden bearer, he shares their afflictions, comforts their distresses, relieves their soul hunger, and wins their hearts to God. Here it says very quickly, in this work, the minister is attended by the angels of heaven, and he himself is instructed and enlightened in the truth that maketh wise unto salvation. Powerful for what God is doing, both for the members, both and the minister. I will leave the rest in your own time. I want to finish up here. We may just uh, close with these quotes here. Let's finish up. It says, in some respects, the pastor occupies a position similar to that of a foreman of a gang of laboring men or the captain of a ship's crew. What does that mean? Notice, for that minister, for that pastor, it says they are expected to see that the men over whom they are set, notice, do the work assigned to them correctly and promptly. Wait a minute. Do you see the conversation where it's headed? When the minister visits you in your home, he's coming as a foreman. What is he also coming to do? He's coming to make sure what? The work assigned to them is correct, done correctly and promptly. Make sure you're prepared. The minister is coming to your home to help you to follow Christ and to show you where in your life you're not following, and to also re remind you of your calling, your responsibility to do the work that is specifically assigned to you. That's what, that's what comes with personal ministry. That's what comes with the visit. That's what comes with this relationship. Why are we here? Why, why are we in church? Is it just to hear good preaching, or is it to do the work? Aren't we save to serve? Isn't that the reason? Yes. It says, and only in case of emergency are they to execute in detail. That is the minister. You can read this story in your own time. Um, I can make this available, but she's talking about how a, a manager came to a, a job and he saw the people weren't uh, accomplishing the work. So he began to do the work. And then his boss came and says, you know what? I'm going to fire you. Uh, because you're doing the work of the other men. Uh, if you want a pastor to be fired, let that pastor do the work the church is supposed to do. That's the real reason a pastor should be fired when he is doing what the church should actually be doing. That's what that story is talking about. You can read it in your own time. It says, where do pastors fail? It says, this incident may be applicable in some cases and not in others. As a matter of fact, this is the reference to this above paragraph uh it's a uh those two or these two paragraphs are found on gospel workers page 197 and 198 for those who want to know uh, but as i said i can send this to the signal or an email it says but many pastors fail in not knowing how or in not trying to get the full membership of the church actively engaged in the various departments of church work do you hear that what often happens? Well, members may look at the pastors and say, pastors are failing. But they're usually not talking about the pastor is failing in the sense that the pastor hasn't got me to do what I need to do. It's usually the pastors are failing at what they should be doing because I think they should be doing more. But she makes it very clear. 
these pastors are failing where and not knowing how or in trying to get the full membership of the church actively engaged in the various departments of church work. So as members, don't let us fail. Hold us accountable and holding you accountable to do your work that's required of you. Our work is to bring you the bread, to bring you the rod, and to remind you of the calling on your life. That is our work to the church, but your work is for the world. Your work is for those who don't believe. We're going to see that more. I'm preparing to close. It says if pastors would give more attention to getting and keeping their flock, notice, actively engaged at work, they would accomplish more good and have more time for what? Study and religious visiting and also to avoid many causes of friction. You see why it's causes of why it's friction in the church? The pastors have to come up to the, to the plate to do their part and the members have to come up to do their part. How can we help the members as pastors? It says the best help that ministers can give the members of our church is not sermonizing. We already read this, didn't we? It needs to be less sermonizing, more personal labor, we read, right? But what's going to happen in personal labor? Notice, the best help that, can, that ministers can give the members of our church is not sermonizing, but notice, planning work for them. Did you know that that's what your pastor should be doing? Planning work for you? Drawing close to you to remind you that there's a calling upon your life and then saying, Here's a plan. This is what you can do. This is where your talent set in the church or be faithful. Personally recognize what is your talent and recognize the need and do the work that God has called you to do. It says, give each one something to do for others. Help all to see as a minister now. This is from the minister's perspective. Help all to see that as receivers of the grace of Christ, they are under obligation to work for him and let all be taught how to work, especially to those who are newly come to the faith, be educated to become laborers together with God. Last statements here. What shall we preach? Many times people have come to me and said, you know what would be good if you preached on this? And I'm not putting them down. Praise God. I agree. I say, man, I, I do need to preach on that some more. But she says, what shall we preach ministers? Notice, preach the truths that will lead to personal labor for those who are out of Christ. Encourage personal effort in every possible way. So the personal ministry, the personal labor of a minister is to come close to encourage to personal labor. So yes, we need to do less sermonizing and more encouraging of the members to work, more encouraging of the members to take up their work, drawing close to see the needs of the uh, members in their homes, see where things are not going right, and then encouraging them to be faithful and take up the work, not only in their home, but in the world alike. It says, let ministers teach church members that in order to grow in spirituality, they must carry the burden that the Lord has laid upon them, the burden, of leading, the burden of leading souls into the truth. Those who are not fulfilling their responsibility should be visited, prayed with, and labored for. So when she does specifically mention visiting here, she says the purpose behind this visiting is also to what? Notice, those who are not fulfilling their responsibility what do you mean their responsibility? They are not answering their call to work. Surely they need a visit. So our unfaithfulness and not visiting can, what can you say? Uh, what's the word? Perpetuate unfaithfulness in others. So surely the members need to be visited, but they also need to hear the call upon their life. That's one of the reasons to encourage them to follow God but to encourage them to work for God. That's the best thing I can do as a minister to plan work for someone. It's not the preaching. That's not the best thing you can do. It's not the sermonizing. The best thing you can do is to say, hey, let's work. Let's get to work. It says, do not lead people to depend upon you as ministers. Wait a minute. 
Did you hear that? I am not to lead people to depend upon me as a minister. Many hear that and they don't know where, where to place that because many have been led to depend upon a minister. They, this is how it works. You're the leader, so I'm depending upon you. But wait a minute. Do not lead the people to depend upon you as a minister. Teach them rather, notice, that they are to use their talents in giving the truth to those around them. Wait a minute. That's solemn. I must recognize my responsibility to personally labor for the members of the church. As pastors, that's what we are to focus on. But our focus in personal ministry is to lead the people to work. Don't depend upon me as a minister. I'm here to teach you to work. That's what you're going to receive from me. You're going to be fed from me to do what God wants you to do. It says, in laboring where there are already some in the faith, the minister should at first seek not so much to convert unbelievers. Notice this. A lot of times the focus and the anticipation is, Lord, we need to get to work. We need to go to the world, to the unbelievers. And we do. That, that's always a burden upon us. Woe unto us if we preach not the gospel. But wait a minute. Slow down. Organization takes place. There's some steps to get to that point, right? It says, in laboring where there are already some in the faith. So this is a special case, right? These are those who are in the faith. They say that they're believers. These are the ones who know how things should go. These are the ones who attend church. They're like, I'm settled. I'm not leaving. It says the minister's duty for them at first is at first is to seek not so much to convert unbelievers. In other words, not to necessarily start a new work to go out and gather in per se. It says the, the, what he must do first is train the church members for acceptable cooperation. So this is equivalent to saying, I'm teaching you not to depend upon me, but to work with me. Because some people hear that and they say, well, he's a leader. Aren't, shouldn't the church depend upon the leader? The church should work with the leaders. They work together. They both have a role. They both have a calling. Where there is a lack, of course, somebody has to take up the slack. You may have to do multiple things because in the process, you're teaching someone to recognize their responsibility. Then they will relieve that burden. They can take their place, and then you can better focus on your role. As she said earlier, now you can spend more time reading and studying and working for others in the church, but help them first to see their responsibility. It says, let him labor for them individually, endeavoring to arouse them to seek for a deeper experience for themselves. This is the work of the pastor. This is describing the uh, leaving off of the too much sermonizing and doing more personal labor. What is the minister doing? Let him labor for them individually, endeavoring to arouse them to seek for a deeper experience themselves and to work for others. When they are prepared to sustain the minister by their prayers and labors, greater success will attend his efforts. Wait a minute, whose efforts is that? The minister's efforts. We may read and say, okay, we read this quote and it says, unless the minister is doing these things, he will not meet success. His efforts will not be large. And we don't realize that that statement is directly tied to the efforts of the members as well. In other words, the members recognizing their call, being visited by the ministers, recognizing they need a deeper experience and that they are also to share in the work or to co-labor with the pastor. Then his efforts will be a success. Then those new believers who come in as a result of the preaching and hearing of the gospel, then they can remain and not be thrown away by the unconverted, the unconversions in the life of the ministers or the church. I hope you understand, brothers and sisters. As we talk about the needs of the body, how the body must be fed, and how that illustrates all of our responsibility, a responsibility to, uh, that is upon all of us, the woe that is upon all of us if we don't do personal labor. Everyone is required to do personal labor. Everyone is required 
to come up higher. This is how God shows how the body can be properly fed. Properly fed. It's when everyone is doing their part. Every single individual. The minister has a role where they have been unfaithful. They must be faithful. The church has a role where they have been unfaithful. They must be faithful. And when we do this, then we can expect the blessing of the Lord. I want to close with one text in Ephesians. Let me grab my Bible. Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four. There were still some things that we skipped over for time's sake. I see all the points. Uh, there are some things that were skipped over, so we may finish that with the next time we were together before we finish up this series. But nevertheless, I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, we began with God saying, return. Then in calling us to return to him, he says, I'm merciful. This is not to put anyone down. God is, God is not about putting us down and discouraging us. He wants us to see where we have fallen so that we can get up, so that we can stand up. Uh, unfortunately, we don't think we're falling. We think that we're okay. We think that others have fallen and that we are in a good position. But God says, please, you're falling. Pick up where you have fallen. Return to me because I'm merciful. I'm married to you. I'm committed to you. That is what God is saying. But we must say, Lord, I will return and I will be committed to you. We must make the same decision. Marriage cannot work with one party, with a one party agreement. That's just not how it works. Both parties need to do their place or agree at least. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter four, our last text here, Ephesians chapter four. The Bible says here, verse 11, and he, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Can you imagine if we said all the work was just to the prophets? All the work was just to apostles? We, are we just focusing on the work of one? Do you notice how all of the parts are necessary? In other words, everyone's ministry was necessary and everyone's ministry fed the body. Do you notice? It says, for the perfecting of the saints, Notice, for the what? The work of the ministry. Every part is necessary for the saints to be perfected. Every part is necessary for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, for the body to be strengthened, for the body to have health. It says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'll end it there. What does God reveal to us? That we need to come up higher as a body. We're all connected. We are a body. We all have our part from the pastors down to the membership. May we humble ourselves before God, recognizing God's love. He says, I'm married to you. I'm committed to you. You have not been committed to me, but I am committed to you. This is forever. This is until death. That's how God is looking at it. That means that until we turn our backs on God, until we fully give up, until probation closes. That's one place that probation closes is at death. Until probation closes, God says, I'm committed. But he's looking for you and I to be committed. Wherever your position is, whether it's where I am as pastor, where it's as a member, where there's some member on the side who doesn't think that they're involved in all of the workings of the church, you're, you're involved. You're a part of the body. You have a responsibility to feed someone with your talents, your gifts, your effort. It's required. I pray that we all come up. The beauty is that we can all be saved. We can all do a faithful work. We can all find our part without criticizing and condemning someone else or, or, or recognizing someone else's neglect. We can all do our part and being faithful, we can encourage others to do theirs. And until they do it, we can do it. But we have to all work together. If every one of us take a small part of someone else's neglect, then that part can get done. But let's be faithful first. Let's do our part. And if there is a lack, let's take it up. 
Let's do it as unto the Lord until somebody else recognizes their call. And let's help them. Let's help one another because we need each other, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we just acknowledge our personal faults where we personally have fallen. It's easy to see other people's faults. But Paul said in Galatians that if we see our other brother taken in the fault, that we need to consider ourselves. Lord, you allow us to see the faults in others as a warning, as a witness, not for the purposes of condemnation. You allow me to see someone else's neglect and faults and sin so I can see my own sins, my own neglect. You gave us that instruction in Galatians 6, where you tell us that we need to consider ourselves lest we be overtaken, lest we fall. Lord, help us. We've been using others' examples the wrong way. We've used it to condemn. We've used it to be prideful and self-righteous. We've used it to put them down and ourselves up. But Lord, help us to do things rightly. Help us to remember that we're in the body that we need each other, and that when we see needs, that with our efforts and with our talents, with whatever we have that can help, we are to put it forth because it reveals our faith and works. Help us, Lord, to recognize the call on every one of our, on each of our lives, that we need to lay down our lives for others, for the body, for the brethren, and help us to be faithful. My simple prayer and appeal it's for the one who says, Lord, I see where I am unfaithful in my life. And that's what I desire to be corrected. I see where I have not been faithful. Many may see some type of faithfulness or many may see what I'm doing and say, wow, they are a, a, a person of God. They, they are faithful. But I see where I have not been faithful. I see where I have neglected to do all that has been required. And I see that you are married to me. You are joined to me. You are committed to my salvation. And today I want to accept your command to return. It's not about no one else. It's about you individually, as it is in the judgment, and how you will be judged for what you have done in the body. And you say, Lord, I want to acknowledge my sin, my neglect, my failures. No one else may know what I've done or what I have not done, but I know. And you say, Lord, I want to come up higher. I want to do my part. And I ask for strength to fulfill someone else's role who is unwilling. Lord, we already feel burdened. We already feel like we got too much to do and we don't want to do other people's work. But Lord, we are in the body. We need each other. It may be I might have to take up the slack for someone else. It may be that I may have to put extra effort, but I've laid down my life. And where I am weak, Lord, we can, I can be made strong. Lord, we can take hold of your strength where we feel weak and overwhelmed or that we're doing too much and then take up the slack. Even. Lord, help us. We need you. We, got, we have so much inside. So many conflicting emotions, so much life experience has taught us and has shaped us. And we have not allowed your word to wholly shape us. But today we're allowing and asking you to shape us as a body, even as you did for Adam. Make us the church you want us to be. Make us the people you want us to be. And then breathe life in us, Lord. Revive us and reform us truly that we can be a happy church, a loving church a church that has Christ truly as the head, where we are not complaining as we were, but we love to serve. Help us, Father. You see the hearts of each and every individual. You know the neglects, the mistakes, the failures, where we have not been faithful. And your word is an invitation to us. You've revealed your commitment and you have said return. You have given us yet another opportunity to redeem the time. And Lord, we want to accept it. And all who say, Lord, I acknowledge my sins. I confess my sins. I, I, I am undone before you. Lord, today we desire to hear your voice saying, who will go? You're inviting us again, another opportunity to work. You do not cast us off. 
You do not uh, remove our calling from us. You do not uh, remove us from the work, but you say, who will go? Lord, we want to respond like Isaiah and say, here I am, send me. Lord, we want to answer the call for you today. We want to pick up where we have dropped the ball, where we have failed. And from this day, redeem the time doing a faithful work unto you and serving others and serving you. And we thank you that you have not given our crown to anyone else, but you have reserved it for us and allowed us an opportunity even today to hold it tightly. May we be faithful. We acknowledge our sin and ask for your mercy. And we believe your promise that because you're a God of great kindness and mercy, that you are a God that delights in mercy, that you are ready to pardon, that you are more than willing to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And your promise is that we shall have mercy and we are willing to accept it today. In Jesus' name, amen.